Okay, welcome back to episode 20 now of Ag Inspire Conversations. And I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. James Moran this evening, who is a lecturer in ecology and biology at Galway Mayo Institute of Technology. And this evening we're having a sort of a different conversation because I suppose I reached out to James to ask him a few, I had a few queries about biodiversity and farming for nature and the future. And um, I, uh, I ended up having a quick chat and I said, you know what, will you have an Ag Inspire conversation with me? And he, he willingly said yes. So first of all, good night to you, James, and uh, thanks for taking time out of uh, the end of your busy day for having a conversation. Good night, Tom, and it's, uh, looking forward to the conversation over the next uh, half an hour or so. Yeah, James, I suppose for me, just to give it perspective, there's so much talk about the environment, there's so much talk about biodiversity, there's so much talk about farming's role in the environment, um, and there's, so much, there's a lot of polarisation, a lot of challenging conversations, and I think the future is... Uh, a bit like this is, is somebody like me talking to someone like you to understand the subject a little bit better. And I think uh, last week I watched David, David Attenborough's uh, documentary, uh, I don't know, have you seen it, um, A Life on This Planet, where he looked back over his career and how the globe has changed. And biodiversity was a key element through it. And I was sitting with dairy farmers this morning, we're working on a project, and they've all watched it. And we're working on a very much a commercial dairy pro project uh, focused on production and efficiency. And it sort of also all stopped us in our tracks and made us think. So I suppose before we get into that, and that's what I want to kind of talk about uh, with you, is maybe give people a bit of insight and a bit of background in your, to yourself. Well, uh, I'm from a dairy farm and background myself, so I am in uh, in Mayo. So I, I grew up uh, milking cows on the on the farm at home, you know, yeah. until uh, essentially we went through all the different cycles. So uh, I think at home we really got into the the dairy with my mother that started off dairy farming first on right. her home farm, and then she she moved up to the father's place to sold her farm, but moved up the the couple of dairy cows. It was the the start of our own dairy herd and the other farm, you know. So and that was a very small farm. We only had 30 acres in Mayo. So we grew as much as we could, like, you know, and eventually we got to the uh, 15 dairy cows in the in the in the late 80s, start of the 90s, just at the start of the introduction of the of the quota. So I think our quota at the time was uh, 11,000 gallons, you know, right. so it was so it was yeah. uh, enough to, to 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 rear a family just about, but under significant pressure, like, you know, yeah. so so. I grew up seeing seeing the pressure they were under milking cows morning and evenings and at weekends, you know, and uh, always wanted to be a farmer, to be honest. So for, from the time that I was three or four, it was farming and nothing else farming, you know. But then I think I made a, a realisation coming when I, the more I was showing the accounts and the more I was involved in actually picking out the, the, the bulls out of the eye book and everything like, you know, by the time I came to 12 or 13, I saw it as a, as a struggle, particularly at that size of a farm. And I thought, right. We need to find something that's a bit more well paid. So I thought at twelve or thirteen, what was the most best well paid farmer you saw coming into the yard? It was the vet, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's I thought a well paid. Sorry, yeah, man. maybe it's a slight bit. <laughs> So that was that was it for a while. But I think at the end of the day, I think even at home with the father had a, had a, a big interest in nature, a big interest in the environment and always worked like working out in nature. I think a lot of farmers are, are the same way. And some of that seeped into me. And eventually when the time came to make the decision, I decided to rather than doing the agriculture or veterinary route in UCD, I just got it into my head. We do the try the environmental science in uh, in Gaula, which was, of course, down the road. And it was a for for a country farm boy. It was a bit better than go, having to travel all the way up to Dublin, no matter how attractive maybe the, the courses were in UCD, you know. Okay. So I, I stuck with Galway. And I'd say, to be honest, if uh, agricultural science was still in Galway at the, at the, in UCG at the time, I probably would have ended up in that route, but ended up in the environmental science. And I suppose it was during that time as well that decisions had to be made on the home farm and what we were going to do. We like the operation at the time we had we had to invest in getting the, the the dairy hygiene up to scratch. So we'd spent a bit of money on that. And then the yard had to be upgraded and everything. And it just, the economics of it just weren't working out, you know, at that stage. And also I, I remember just as I was finishing the finishing the degree in the in the 90s, like, you know, the, the father at that stage, they weren't the happiest in farming because of the pressures that were under. And he saw that there might be an easy way of making, making some money. So he was thinking about maybe doing something part time as well. So I was given an ultimatum when I was finished college, like, what am I doing now? Like, you know, yeah. so I had got a job. Well, it was strange for an agricultural or an environmental scientist, but I had got a job as a as a reps planner just starting off. And that was down in Gort. So that was a good 50, 60 kilometers from, from home, you know? Yeah. And I remember 
the first six months out of going home, evenings, weekends, milking cows, as well as as well as that, you know, it and and the economics of it working out, and then having to make a decision whether we were going to invest another 20, 25 grand in a new slatted shed and upgrading the facilities like it was never going to work out. So we made the most difficult decision I've ever made. The father, the father found it a lot easier than me, I think, you know, we, so we, he went into the early retirement and we decided to, to get a, a local dairy farmer in to, to rent it out like, you know, and I still remember the day selling them cows out of the yard. It was, it was not easy at all, like, you know, and walking that, that, down that, into the yard a, afterwards. That's a lifetime of work that leaves in a, in a lorry in a day, isn't it? Oh, shocking. And I remember because I was I was picking it was me. I was the left of the decision for the previous 10 years of that picking out the bulls from the eye. Now, I'd made some mistakes with going a bit too much Holstein. And yeah. some of the some of the father said the horses, the cattle look more like racehorses than actual dairy cows because it was a lot of British freeze and we started off with, you know, right. so it is. And some of them had a few were only lasting a couple of years with bad feet as well. So there, it wasn't <laughs> some didn't go very well. But still, at the end of the day, I knew every single cow in the yard and I knew even from I knew the cows that had come out of my mother's farm and down the lineage all the way down, you know. So that so it was a very difficult decision. But I always remember when they're going out, I, I sort of pledged walking back out of the yard that that would be stocked again, like you know. So it is, and I'm I've got back farming on sort of a part time basis with the help of cousins at home, like you know. But they're just taking some of their dairy replacements, you know. But it's not it's not the same, like you know. So that you don't see you don't have the same connection as going in milking cows morning and evening, like you know. Now I've always said to myself, you know, that I'm eventually going to go back. Uh, farm and full time, you know. But uh, the more the years have gone on, I said first I was going to do it by the time I was thirty. Then I was going to do it by the time I'm I was forty. You know, it'll it'll be uh, it'll be fifty four. I'm at it now. I know, you know. But uh, it's it's always that way, and I won't be. I definitely won't be entitled to any young farmer assistance going back. You know, so it is. But that's 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 still there. So I suppose that's that is sort of uh, an imprint on the way I deal with things. So my formal scientific training is all in the environment, and so that's. I suppose I'm making a long story short as well. It's one of the reasons we got out in the 90s as well. I'd done my fourth year project on the farm in terms of water quality, like, you know, yeah. and uh, tested a few of the open wells and uh, the pump house as well. Like, and uh, the, you could, you, we had done the testing over the year and you could track every time we, because uh, it was shallow limestone soil, half of it was reclaimed from, from rock, you know, and the other half was, was good arable uh, deep soil, like, you know, and I could pick up every time we spread fertilizer within two weeks in the, in the wells. I could pick up when we spread the, the, the farmyard manure. And then I could definitely pick up in the winter time when we had the cattle in the open yard with just a makeshift uh, dung stead, like, you know, there was constant uh, E. coli in the wells and in the, in the pump supply as well, you know, to such an extent at one stage that even though we had the, the silage clamp the, and it was a good 100 meters fra- from the well, the, the water turned orange at one stage. And that was because the basically the silage effluent got into it and corroded the liner, and you could pick it up from the in the discoloration of the of the water. So that really brought it home. up until then. Like, and even I remember talking to the father about it. We had absolutely little or no understanding of the the trouble we were causing. You know, so that that would sort of put pay to us any any thoughts in our own heads as well of trying to struggle on without having everton up to up to scratch in terms of the pollution control facilities etc so it wasn't at that stage it wasn't environment science i was really concentrating on the on the water quality and then i got into the reps planning and a lot of the stages in early reps and it was in reps one and two that i started off working in it was a lot of it was about getting these facilities into farms having the 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 grants in to actually put in the slatted sheds and and get everything up to speed to sort out this point source pollution but i remember my own fourth year project at the time and i still have it here on the shelf shelf behind me from the from the 90s and one of my final conclusions and i always look at it every so often was yeah, are we actually going to so- solve the point source pollution but create a, a diffuse source pollution with the amount of, of of slurry we're going to collect and how are we actually going to actually spread this in a way on the land with the intensity that we're at that wasn't going to cause the the, the same problems you know so there's so I, i've had this in the in the back of my high, mind for for 20 years i worked as a reps planner then for for a couple of years but that and, and advising farmers from a very young age. And I remember because we had the same the struggles of, I remember advising a farmers down in, down in West Clare one day, one, one, I was into one farm and I was, I was nearly there until 11 or 12 o'clock at night. And I was only a young lad's time. My father, we were doing exactly the same situation at home. One farmer, the, 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 
he was after getting a heart attack. So he was. And he had a young son who was only around eight, not ready to take over. The wife was in a wondering what they were going to do. Like, you know, saying we cannot go on because he was driving a truck at the time and milking and everything as well. Similar situation. The pressure was just too much, you know. Mm. And I went into the into the into the farmer, just happened to be next door. I was calling to both of them at the same time. And uh, he said, oh, we, I don't know what we're going to do here. The, the children are getting a bit older, but we need to sort of expand or get out like, you know, so it is. So I says, uh, you haven't been talking to each other next door, have you? You don't know the situation that both here in the, I know we'd rarely talk about these sort of things. And I says, I says, I, I got into the car and I drove into next door. I says, you wouldn't believe the conversation after having it, which I won't mention any names now, but yeah. your man next door, he says, thinking about expanding. He's not, is he sure? What's he thinking about that for? And so then I, within two weeks, going, I, I explained to us, you need to talk to each other. Within two weeks, I had one of them in the early retirement, the other one taken over the land, one expanding, and the other lad, it just worked out well in the end, like, you know. Yeah. So that, that to me was sort of uh, an epiphany as well in terms of working with the farmers that there is, they need to talk to each other more, working in partnership, and we can manage land by coming together more. So that was sort of the environment side. It was this social aspect. It was farmers, farmers working together, needing to talk together, together more as well. But then I was dealing a lot with the, the regulations all the way through the, the reps. And we'd gone on to by 2000 on to reps three or reps four. I remember I'd done some of the, the commonage management plans as well back in 1999. Some of the original pilot ones over around Roundstone, actually. And I remember doing this and they were a very blunt instrument. They were brought in at the time because they were actually things were so bad on the hills that Europe were threatening withhold at all uh, payments to farmers, hedge payments, everything in, in Ireland and because the situation was so bad. So it was brought in as a very blunt instrument and people were just blanket destocking, you know. And I remember doing some of the commonage management plans. The process was quite good. You know, we assessed them, came up with uh, the, 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 the assessment categories, whether they were severely damaged, moderately or, or undamaged, and assigned a destocking calculation to that. But that, that was applied then to all shareholders equally. And I remember being back in, in Termakidi a couple of weeks later doing a 20-hour reps training course. I was sitting down in the bar afterwards, and I'd mentioned that I was involved in these commonage management plans. And some of the lads mentioned to me, they said, God, God, when we heard this coming in first, we thought this was going to be great, you know, because we, we all know the situation. We, we all have the same shares in the commonage. I have 80 yos. Your man over the hill there is 800. We thought this is it at last. You know, we can't we can stop him expanding, but this is going to bring it down on him. Didn't we all get the same 60% he's stocking? I'm down to 30 and no point in me putting up them anymore. And he's down to 200. Right. So it is. And he can now graze the hill freely because the rest of us won't go back up with the numbers we had, you know? So it is. So that to me, the sort of blunt instruments, you know, didn't work from that stage. So I was getting gradually more and more frustrated as a, as an advisor, you know, and thinking I can't, we can't be doing with this. So I went, went, I went off actually. I just, cause we'd after getting out of the farm as well at the same time. So the headspace needed to be sorted out. So I went off traveling for a year, you know, yeah. so it is. And uh, as I was, as I was traveling, I still, you know, I was within six months of, or six weeks of coming home and I didn't know what I was going to do. And uh, I remember I was in Quebec city and I saw this advert in the back of the new scientist for a, uh, for a PhD and it was on Turlocks and we had Turlocks in the farm at home and I'd always had, it was, it was always a place I like to go just to relax and sort of get the headspace right and sort of, it was in the lab I used to be in in Galway. I thought this is a bit strange sitting in Quebec seeing this, but I thought no notes of it. Then I went back and just checked my emails and one of the, one of the girls I was in college would had emailed me about the same one, like, you know, the same PhD. Listen, this is coming up in the lab, James. Like, this is ideal for you. You know, it's going to be looking at grazing practices, farming, wetlands, yada, yada. So she says, and then I thought no more of it. And I went off. And uh, just as we were outside Quebec City, the, the, the bus driver pulled out at a, at a filling station. And outside the window was a phone box. And I wasn't, I was still not doing it. And just as he was about to pull out, I said, hold on a minute, I'm going to make a phone call. So I rang, I rang the, rang the lecturer in the, in the college. I says, is this, what's the closing date like on this? And he says, oh, it's closing today. But if you can get the application into me uh, this evening, you know, now this is 1999. It wasn't exactly the <laughs> internet cafes were too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So after, after I got out of the phone box, hopped back into the bus and, and we were going, it was during the summertime, we were on these moose travel tours, you know, these hop on and hop off buses, you know. And I was thinking we were going to Montremblant next and it was a ski resort, but it was closed during the, it was summertime. So all that was open was the hostel. So I got out of this place and I need, went to the reception. I, had, I need to get a CV off and I had it on a three and a half inch floppy disk, you know. Yeah. I said, I need to get this off to, to Galway. And they said, yeah, I don't know, it's going to be answered. But there's an architect's office down the road there. Go down and see. 
walk into the art text office. She says, oh, you're from Ireland. She says, no, thick Canadian accent. She says, says, I'm Irish too. I'm well, fifth generation, you know. <laughs> so she got the CV, changed it for me and everything and sent it off, you know. And I was sitting in the, I got a phone call back you know, uh, later. And he said, yeah, we will give you an interview. But you have to be able to do an interview. And I says, well, I'll be in Boston in three weeks time. So in my cousin's house. So I'm sitting in the house in Boston, the cousin's house, just rang him and managed to get the PhD after that, you know. So, this, so that's how I became an ecologist and worked on, on biodiversity. It was sort of, sort of pu- pure chance. But since that, then I've been, that was 2000. So for the last 20 years, sort of that was a change. And I've worked then since that on the interactions between nature, farming, biodiversity, bringing in a bit, of course, of my experiences with the, the water issues before that as well. So, and, and on the farming side, so I'm a bit, I suppose, always from the start, the, the, I remember when I got a job in Chagas after the, the PhD, working on the Burn Light Programme as well, a lot of the agricultural scientists thought I was a, an environmental scientist, and a lot of the environmental scientists thought I was an agricultural scientist. So I've always been on that sort of uh, uh, schizophrenic sort of role. Am I an agriculturalist today, or am I an environmentalist today? And it sort of often depends what how side of the bed I end up on, you know. It's very interesting. Like the, well, typical Mayo man finding a way to do things in the local architects in Quebec to get your floppy disk uh, and get your. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But there's a very important, like, there's a lot of conversations about the environment of farming at the moment, right? And I find that it's really polarizing conversations. All bad. It's all, you know, it's, it's very poor. Yeah. And I suppose. I remember two years ago, I wrote an article that I was writing for Farmer Journal about cow housing. We said it at the start before we came on. And yeah. um, I wrote about peat bedding as, as a source of, for cow comfort. Uh, and you sent a message to me uh, very politely saying um, that you enjoyed my articles every week, but you would disagree with me on peat for the reasons of, of its ability to sequester carbon. And I always registered that in the back of my head. Was, that wasn't polarizing. You were very fair about it. And you changed my perspectives on it when I started thinking and reading about it. But just before we get into that, you, you did mention, and it's very important, the challenge of farming, the economics of it, the experience of that at home. And I think, you know, farming has been tasked with the job over the last decades to produce food efficiently, uh, safely, and ultimately now cheaply. We can see household spends going down on food. And, and, and now we're having a debate around where farming will go for the next 10 years. And rightly so, the environment yeah. is one of the key priorities. But there's a lot of confusion in, in the market, I would say, James. There's a lot of, you know, name calling. There's not enough conversations between people who have knowledge on both sides of the fence. So I suppose that's what I was aiming to do this evening is have a conversation with you about that. Um, yeah. Would you like to, I suppose, set out the stall maybe on, and this is a big question now, we know on the EU being deal and all that, about, about what farming might look like in the next 10 years. Um, we might get into biodiversity on its own because it's a subject yeah. that confuses me and confuses other people as well. Um, but what, what are you thinking right now from your experiences? And, uh, and I'm going to label you as an environmentalist for the evening, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, which but, but, which but, I don't uh, like the tag, but go on. <laughs> I know, but, but I think people will appreciate there from your introduction that you're honest. Um, that you've thought a lot about this, that you've come from a farm, um, and you're not coming from a place of criticism. You're 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 coming from a place of maybe trying to improve things and help people's understanding. So, mm. what what will the next decade look like as we shift away from maybe that? Because that's going to put pressure. Because economic sustainability, we all we're yeah. all challenged by that. How, how do we put money in farmers' pockets? Who does that? If we reduce, if we go from in, ex, intensification to extensification. Is it the consumer? Is it government funding? Is it more uh, targeted schemes? So what will the next decade, and it's a hard question, look like? Well, I think, to be honest, it's going to be an awful lot more about uh, matching the capacity of the land to what it's capable of, of producing. So I don't think it's going to be extensive versus intensive, or definitely it's not going to be one size fits all. So we're going to definitely see an awful more lot more nuanced approach to, to land management in general. And I think farmers' role, it, it's changing at the moment, but it's going to be seen as an awful lot more wider role. And I would hope that as farmers uh, sort to take on a much more wider role that their standing and value to in society is going to be much much higher up the pecking order than it, than it, than it currently is you know as you say there's a lot of negativity around it at the moment and farmers feel rightly or wrongly like the like the whipping boys but i think it's it's not the it's not the farmers on the ground that are often the problem it's the the policy directions were, were taken and that's in no one's individuals individuals hands so if we take it from the point of view that we're going to 
acknowledge farmers' role that they're much more, well, we see it already, we've tried this since the 90s with the McSharry Forum, that it's been stating that farmers are much more than, than f- food producers. They're also custodians of, of the environment. And always from when we're basically knee high, once we're, once we're walking on farms, it's bet into us that we have to hand on the farm in a, in a better state, you know, so it is. But better all the way through the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s and 70s and 80s, you know, as we all grew up with it, was based on improving the land, land reclamation, you know, sort of one more cow, one more acre under the plough, you know, was what our father's generation and mother's generation was 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 brought up on, you know. So this, and, you know, in a way, that was what was needed uh, at the time. But by the time the 80s came, we knew there was consequences to this that were going to lead to the ultimate demise of the, the land and, and basically poisoning of the land and pollution of the land was the word that was coming. It was only coming into the, the thinking at the time. So as we moved the 1990s, now things are a bit slow and changing, as you can imagine, which was nearly hundreds of years of this, uh, what we thought we were doing was the right thing and, and bettering the land to maybe going a bit too far with it and now having to redefine what better is. So I think in the context of the next 10 years, what better is going to be is farmers, as they have sort of, the, they're the managers of the vast majority of the land uh, in Ireland, for, for example. So nothing we can do in terms of, of land use can be done without farmers. So if we see that that land now has to produce food, has to produce fibre, has to uh, secure clean water supplies, has to provide clean air, has to provide space for, for, for nature, has to provide recreational activities, and particularly where I'm living on the, on the West Coast, has huge potential in terms of rural development and uh, uh, bringing in tourism revenue to supplement farming income in these areas and have greater greater supply and, and basically a dual role in that. So I think we're going to see that farmers are going to, and, and the wider policy is going to have to take a step back, look at individual landscapes, in the individual farms, say, right, this land has very good, deep, fertile soils. The key role for that bit of land is producing food and fibre high quantities, high qualities, but within certain environmental constraints that we know that it can perpetuate this into the future and continue to do that in a sustainable way. And I think an awful lot has to be done more on fixing the markets. I think uh, going the cheap food policy has has driven uh, farmers to produce quantity at the expense of maybe putting the brakes on at a particular environmental limit. So that's where them farms are going. I, th- I would hope that we would actually see better better, better prices coming, coming to farmers, a fairer uh, supply chain, but also that they will be rewarded for sticking within the environmental constraints that will be basically better for them and better for the environment and the the next generation. Then we might have other bits of land. We think of maybe lands in in upland areas that might be in floodplains and rivers and streams. That was always what was termed uh, marginal land. Now, I never uh, like it, but it's really it's land that has lots of natural constraints in terms of the amount of food and fiber it can produce. But that land is hugely important. It's the highest stores of, of carbon. Many of them are, are, are peat soils. They store, based on the peat soils, it's covered 3% of the, of the world, but store more carbon than all other terrestrial uh, vegetation on the, on the planet, you know? So on a comparison are, per acre for, say, your normal soils versus your peat soils, what's the ability to, for it to sequester carbon if it's left alone? In a comparison per acre, is there, is there such a comparison? Uh, well, we'll say that generally speaking, the, the the arable soils, you know, in relatively good condition would have anything from four to seven or eight percent uh, organic matter. You think of land under under permanent grassland, you know, might be up on anything from that we'll say the, the six to 14 percent. But w- when you're getting into these peat soils and also glay soils, you're talking about uh, carbon content in them of them from 14 up to 50 percent plus uh, uh, of carbon and we now we say that uh, basically under uh, mineral soils they can become saturated with with carbon and they cannot sequester anymore they come into a bit of a balance you know but peat soils particularly under under wet conditions continue to grow about a, a millimeter a year and even a, a, a peat soil that is that is drained, we'll say for 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 forestry or, or drained for peat extraction, the height of it can decrease by about two and a half meters in the space of a couple of years. So that you know the, the that amount of land is lost. So that just shows you the amount that can accumulate and and store carbon. You know. So I know it's not a, not a, maybe exa- answering your question exactly. No, but, but you're giving us, you're giving me some perspective on it. And again, it's back maybe to my earlier comment about peat bedding, which is 
we've been commonly talking about now. And there's been a reversion on beat bedding because we've seen board pneumonia cease operations. We've seen, you know, um, we've seen a lot of changes there. And I suppose if I'm a farmer and I'm looking at what are my options for bedding and I've used beet yeah. bedding, it works. And it can be a hard sell to me to understand that outside my farm gate, um, the relevance of maybe the bit of peat that I've got. Um, and, yeah. and, and it's about understanding the capacity of our PT soils to do just as you said. Yeah, exactly. And, and th that's, th that's the thing. Once you start draining uh, a peatland, straight away you start, the reason it's, it's, it's basically building up organic matter is because it's uh, lo low oxygen because it's flooded, like it's in oxic mm. conditions. So the, the material that's growing each year doesn't break down and it's stored in the soil. But as soon as you run a drain, through that, irrespective of whether you extract it or not, as soon as you run a drain through that, you start aerating the, the surface area, you're exposing the uh, basically humus and organic matter that's been stored over hundreds and thousands of years to the air. The aerobic bacteria start to break that down and, and feed on it essentially. And through this process of just respiration, they just respire the, the CO2 off into the into the atmosphere, you know? So breaking down that thing. So it's, it's that microbial sort of, ecology within the the peat soil once it's aerated that starts breaking it breaking it down and then of course it start, if you, once you start taking off the, the vegetation and drying it out either whether it goes into a an esb power station or whether it goes into a a bedding you know there's as well as the, it being broken down by the bacteria then you're basically burning it off taking the energy off and going up a smokestack or but within a within a bedding system it's still breaking down within the shed you know and when you spread it back onto the land you incorporate it into the soil a certain amount is going to go in as humus into the soil so it's not all going to go off into the into the atmosphere but still the bacteria within the soil are going to break that down release the nutrients and respire the the co2 so eventually it's all going to be broken down it just might be a, a slower process when you use it for bedding and incorporate it into soil than putting it directly into a, a peat fired peat fired station and of course i of, I, would, I often have this discussion with the students the agriculture environment management students in, in galway as well and we like i grew up we grew we had we had a peat bog you know we couldn't afford and anything else that was our fuel source you know and i i i spend summers and i can't understand when someone is given an alternative why they want to go the bog is back break and work like you know and also we have when when we were stuck you know we went over to the bog and took out bags of turf mole and brought it back and used it in the sheds as well so i know how much of a, a clean dry lie it is for the animals and how, how how good it is for them as well from that point of view you know but when you understand the the more holistic picture of it like you know then it's not to say that what, what we were doing is right or wrong you know everything is great great in hindsight but i think our generation in particular you know we have no excuses you know so there's there, there we have so much information out there now i know there is an awful lot of noise out there as well you know and misinformation on on both sides and it's trying to figure out what's the the correct information but there's some things like the the peat bedding you know at this stage particularly in 2018 and understand when the drought conditions came you know as bedding was in short supply people people were caught you know and i think in that sort of a situation i know of myself i was still farming and I had nothing else to put under animals like you know you you would know that there was that you couldn't keep doing this and you'd probably do it for for a year but you definitely shouldn't keep doing it and you plan better for the next year, you know? And I think this is one of the things as well, when we're pushed to such the limit and if we're farming in any type of land, you know, and if we're at or near the carrying capacity and always pushing the limit and the only thing that's going to keep us viable is to make sure, is to hope that we have a good year this year, like for grass growth, you know, and that the weather conditions aren't going to come too much against us, you know? Then you're then you're overstocked, you know. In 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 my mind, you have to have that window of uh, variability in the system that allows you to respond to whether you get a bad spell or, or a good spell. You have to have that sort of uh, resilience built into the the system. And I think it's only in the, in the last number of years that we've seen people, particularly in the advisory service, uh, talking about this resilience and headroom coming in, you know, and. I don't. I, people say it's climate change, but I remember when I was when I was doing my my undergrad in the in the late nineties. We had discussed all this at the time in environmental science courses, like you know. And I remember looking at, at books that were published on the on the climate of Ireland when I was doing my studies because I wanted to look at the the rise and fall of turlocks, which very much mirror the the actual. Uh, 
the weather conditions in the for, previous for couple of weeks. Who do, for people who be, might be listening to this who don't know what turlocks are, just explain what turlocks are, I should ask you. It, basically, turlocks are uh, basically floodplains of underground rivers and streams. So the same as you'd have on a callow on the on the side of a river. When the river gets too much water in the wintertime, it overflows onto the over the banks. Turlocks are essentially occur in limestone karst areas in the west of Ireland. We have little surface water, all rivers essentially in channels and water is under, underground. And essentially, when we get too much rainfall, the, the groundwater comes to the surface in depressions and hollows and is flooded for six or six or seven months, you know. So, this, so a lot of these were drained with arterial drainage systems from the 1850s onwards, you know. But there's some areas that couldn't be drained, the same as some rivers couldn't be channelized, you know. So, this, so these are basically the, the floodplains of our underground drainage system, you know. That's basically it, you know. So they respond very well to the weather conditions. But... Going back to the point on this variability, I remember it was a revelation to me at the time when I read it back in the in the late 90s. I can't remember the author of the book now, but they described the Irish climate. And they said the variability in one month to the next from one year to the next is up to 40 percent in terms of rainfall. So in any one January, we can have 40 percent more or less. In any one May, we can have 40 percent more or less. In any one June, we can have 40 percent more or less. So from that point of view, I remember when I was working as an advisor that I was always thinking in the back of my mind, if you're pushed right to the limit and you're expecting a good year every year, you're going to be one year and four, you're screwed, basically, you know, so it is. And with climate change now, you know, it's nearly every year, you know, so it is. It's so, a huge challenge, but it is, it is this challenge about economics because, you know, before we came on, you, you had to go back to, into the house there to yeah, yeah. your family. And when you when you have a family in front of you and you have a business and you're looking at economics, now some people will always want more and more, but generally people want the house over, roof over their head, food on the table, and a few life's comforts. And the current system is set up to to drive efficiency, to drive yeah. scale. So that's the system we're working. And now I think, and it's probably made that point already, that we're coming to a stage where people are saying that we're, we're, we're going to have to reassess this. And I think everyone's accepting that there's challenges out there, but. My big question is that who is going to pay? Is is our cap? Is our is it going to be Europe? Is it going to be government funding that's going to say, well, uh, this is marginal land. Uh, we need to take the handbrake, pull the handbrake here on the productive capacity of it, and let it sit or lie. And um, who's going to take responsibility for? And I know it's I'm not asking you yeah. to nail your colours, but who's going to take it, 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 the responsibility? Because who's going to pay farmers? Uh, to, to make that shift. Uh, and I think that's an important part of this yeah. conversation, how it may, might happen. Yeah, now we, we had a lot, it's timely we're having this debate because we had a, a long discussion over last week in the Burn Winter School. And we discussed this with, with uh, because it was online with COVID this year, we had basically uh, people presenting to us from all over the world, from, from Japan, South America, Venezuela, South Africa, and the, and the US and, and Europe as well. And we had uh, some of our senior officials within the department in on discussions on this as well, you know, and because we're heavily involved in a lot of these European innovation partnerships and who are finding solutions at local level but how can we scale that up to a to a national eu and global level was some of the discussions we were having having last week and in, in europe we're very much uh, a publicly funded uh, subsidized agricultural system uh, that has moved towards uh, from away away from a, per, a protectionist policy in the from the 90s onwards uh, towards a, a highly subsidized uh, system, you know, and the, the, the situation is now at the moment is a big call for for public uh, payments for, for for public goods, you know, and a lot of people think that the, the 387 billion that we put into the cap on a, on a seven year cycle, you know, should pay for a lot of this. But the problem is that the, the market isn't paying for for the food. So I think there's a there's a dual role here in that we have to have basically we're going to get this pressure from the taxpayer that if the cap funding is to be maintained, even at the levels it's at, to, not talking about it increasing in funding, we have no chance of an increase in funding unless it, it's found to be more uh, efficient and effective in terms of its basic objectives. We see report after report from the European Court of Auditors saying how basically the cap isn't paying for what it says on the on the tin. So that's what's putting pressure on, on the budget. But I do think it's going to switch and it is going to start paying for what it says on the tin. We're going to get basically more of the, the public money tied to environmental performance uh, of, of farms. And one thing is I think 
with this as well, it's always been on the basis of this has been paid for costs incurred and income for gone. I think it has to be paid for on the basis of farmers getting a viable income of producing the environmental product as well. Now, for that to work as well, we have to have basically fixing of the market, common market organisation side of the cap as well. And if we're going to get see more of the money shift away from basically uh, direct payments to farmers towards 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 public goods, then something has to step in to fill the gap. We can't keep pursuing a cheap food policy with that sort of a switch coming in with, with public money. So that comes into the uh, fairness and supply chain. But I discussed this with, with people in the discussion last week as well about in the context of Brexit, and they were talking about bringing in a, a certain protectionist policy, going back to the protectionist policy that was in the EU in the 90s to protect prices for, for British farmers. And... Uh, they were trying to say that this wasn't, then they had their public payments for public goods as well. And we're getting to the situation, well, how do you square the two? Like, you know, and they were saying, well, we're not going to go on a nationalist protectionist policy. We're going to go on a, a protectionist policy for food prices uh, in terms of the environment. So we're going to say that our uh, British farmers need to get paid a higher price for their funding, yeah, for, their, for their projects, because they're producing it to a very high environment standard and animal welfare uh, standard. And then anything that comes into to Britain or comes into the EU and that sort of protectionist policy, it's protectionist from the, point of the view, from the point of the view of the environment, then everything else coming in has to be at them standards as well. So then the production, then you're, you have a level playing field and prices in that sort of a, a policy scenario will rise. Now, that said, I still think that mightn't fix the whole thing because when the people, farmers often say this as well, we, we don't want to be at the whim of the, the politicians and a change in government to say how much money we're going to get for our environmental product, for example. Now, we're always at the whim of the consumer as well on the other side of the market. So it's, it's one customer or the other. So I don't get that argument sometimes. But an interesting discussion we had last week was from... Um, one of the contributors from the states. Now they have a very different structure in terms of their agricultural policy. And they have quite substantial payments now as well for in maintaining the environment, but it's not coming from the, from the uh, public sector, it's coming from the private sector. So under the, no, they said in some states it's, it's better, better done than in others. So they have regulation for, for planning regulations, we'll say, you know, that Basically, when a developer uh, drains a wetland to put in a to put in infrastructure or put in road or put in a factory or something, they have to pay a sort of a, a levy back in to uh, to basically restore an equivalent area, you know, biodiversity offsetting or car carbon offsetting. Yeah. So in the states at the moment, they have accumulation of large funds in these biodiversity offset funds, and they're trying to find ways in which they can pay farmers to actually. Uh, take advantage of this fund and actually create the 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 ecosystems or the biodiversity and supply the, the biodiversity to meet that growing demand and, and offsetting now it's not exactly the way i would like to see it doing because it's just basically allowing one people it's people to pollute they pay but continue on polluting and yeah. another one has to take up the slack but i do think there's something there in the funding that the private sector can create this bank of funding to actually support the, the public sector as well. So you could have two streams of funding. And one of the ways I was thinking about this in the States as well, they're very much interested in the results-based payments that we have uh, in Ireland. So that the same as when an animal goes into the factory, they're scored, the better, uh, better graded they are, the higher price the farmer gets, you know, the, the, the better yield of, of, of uh, produce you have on an arable farm and the better quality is the, the better price you have, the drier it is, for example, the higher protein contents, the better, better price you have to get. We're trying to come up with similar metrics for the environment. So a farmer could have a simple scoring system that they could grade their place themselves, you know, and then they declare that each October in the environmental market and they get paid it either through public or private funds. So this is essentially what we've been doing in the burn now for over, over 10 years. It's trialed in the, in the bride project as well in the intensive dairy environment. But the states are very interested in this as well. They think they can do the same thing with their private equity uh, funds. So I think this is the future. As yeah, more and more I'm awareness. interested in that, and that's why I initially contacted yeah. you. I'm increasingly, um, despite what people think, farmers are definitely having lots of conversations with me around different areas. I started off with animal health, but I, I work in other bits yeah. and areas, and, and, and they're, they're asking me the question about biodiversity, right? And they're asking yeah. me the question, how do I benchmark my, okay, Tommy, we can benchmark production, nutrition, animal yeah. health, but how do I benchmark biodiversity? What do I do? What are the signs I need to look for? I have habitat over here that's not included in my current payment systems. Yeah. Um, so that's my question because 
um, there's a lot of debate around biodiversity. And I think David Attenborough's documentary is incredibly challenging on that one. Yeah. Um, explain to people uh, in simple terms, because we often use these terms and we float them around the place. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes people don't know what they mean. And that's no disrespect to anyone. Yeah. Uh, about what what is biodiversity in a farm and and how in simple terms could someone walk out their gate in the morning or out into their fields in the morning and benchmark now this is the thing about biodiversity you know so biodiversity is everything we're part of biodiversity ourselves we have our microbiome in our own gut with millions of different organisms that basically synthesize things like our vitamin uh, b12 for example you know so they, that's all part of biodiversity so in its very simple terms Biodiversity is the variety of, of life uh, uh, on the planet. So it's everything from the, the microbes in the soil, the grass in the fields, the cows in the fields, the microbiome in, in the cows, the diversity of habitats and ecosystems we have. Everything is the biodiversity we have. And the thing is, we are dependent on biodiversity. Without biodiversity, we don't have cycling of nutrients within, within, our, within, our, within our soils. We don't have the breakdown of organic matter in the soils. We don't have any grass growing in, in, the, in the fields. We don't have actually any oxygen in, in the atmosphere, which is a byproduct of biodiversity through respiration. Now, this doesn't help things in terms of, of benchmarking, you know. But, no, no, no. But, yeah, but, but bi biodiversity, you know, and this is where a lot of us say that, you know, we have no food security without biodiversity. So if biodiversity uh, collapses, you know, so there's our nutrient cycling collapses. Now we might be able to keep it going with bag fertilizer for, for, for a small while, you know, but then as we get to peak oil and we can no longer synthesize fertilizer cheaply, we have to fall back on the natural cycling in the system again. And this is where we're, we're, we're doing this in our agricultural systems at the moment. We know that we're at peak oil. We know that synthetic fertilizers are, are coming, to, coming to an end. And it's not just the nitrogen, like phosphorus comes from, from rock phosphates. It's all depending on mining. It's not a renewable resource. We're going to run out of, of phosphorus, you know? And then we're going to be dependent on the reserves we have within the soil that are only unlocked by microbes, fungi, and the organisms within the soil. So when I, I like to say biodiversity farmers, I say, well, if you're in the field, you're touching it, you're walking it, you're smelling it, you know, you're, you're, de you're dependent on it. But the, the big thing what we see at the moment is biodiversity is declining. So we're seeing the early, early warning systems. So we see that things like curlew, corn crake are, 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 are plummeted over the last 30 years. And I think, well, we're not dependent on them for cycling of nutrients within our soil. Our, our basically, our, the eco, our agricultural productive ecosystems aren't collapsing as a result of them, but they're an early warning system. And I think the best analogy I've ever heard to explain biodiversity and how dependent is the airplane analogy. So say we're flying from Shannon to New York and we're, we're working, we're living in the West Coast and we're, we're working in New York and we're flying back every weekend, you know. So it's, that plane is held together by millions of rivets. So we say these are the organisms on, on the planet and the plane is what we're flying in. We're flying back and over to, to Shannon, Shannon to New York every week. We're expecting the engineers, the policymakers, the scientists are checking the, the plane, we'll say, you know, a couple of rivets fall out one week and say, ah, oh, sure, it's grand, there's millions of other rivets, that they're functionally redundant. The, play, the, the wing isn't going to fall off, there's another couple of hundred there still holding that in. Fly back and over another couple of weeks, another couple of rivets fall out, you know, so this. Then we hear a couple of rattles when we're on the plane and the, and the engineer teeps tell us, ah, it's still all right, you know, we'll, we'll be fine, you know. It comes to a point when basically one single rivet falls out and both engines fall off the plane and we plummet into the sea and we're gone. You know, so this is where we're at with biodiversity loss at the moment. How much, have, time, how much time do we have, James? You know, see, uh, see if, yeah. from an environmental perspective, you know, and I read lots of articles trying to understand yeah. the impact. Look, I have a young family and um, I'm interested in And I think I'm the problem with the environment. We consume too much in our house. We're not. Yeah. I think it's everyone's individual yeah. responsibility. But, you know, how, you know, a tipping point, people talk about tipping points yeah. in, in time. Uh, how yeah. close to that tipping point are we? Or some people say we're gone past it and it's about just yeah. saving what we have. Um, yeah. wh where do you yeah. feel we are on that? Now, the warning systems and the, la uh, the warning signs in the last two years in particular have been stark, like, you know, melting of Siberian ice sheets, you know, no, no summer sea ice in, in, in the Arctic, you know, the, the rising sea levels we see in the boys off the, off, off the, west, off the west coast here, the storm, storm surges we're going to get this, this Friday, possibly even like, you know, the flooding we've seen in Cork uh, last week, you know, 
these are all signs, particularly with, with climate change, that it's going to be nearly impossible now to keep us to, to 1.5 degrees. And people say, well, how is that linked to biodiversity? Well, this is because of how we have used our, now a lot of us, most of us linked to fossil fuels in fairness, and that's basically pipe, pumping into the atmosphere uh, what basically uh, organisms sequestered 330, 600 million years ago in coal and oil fields and, and peat areas, you know, and the natural gas fields, you know. So we're pumping that into the atmosphere as well, you know. But also we're actually destroying the, the basically the ability of ecosystems on the, on the planet at the moment to sequester and offset some of them uh, emissions, you know. So so I'm, you know, I, 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 as a scientist, the only reason I'm working this area is I feel we can do something about it, you know, but time, time is, time is, is running out. I don't believe that it has, has collapsed yet, you know, but I honestly do think if we don't, we meet, we miss target after target. We have the sustainable development goals now in the 2030 uh, agenda, you know, if we're not meeting quite a number of, of, of them goals in terms of, of climate change and, and halting the loss of, of biodiversity. We are going to hand our children an awful legacy to, 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 try, to try, and, try and manage, you know? And that's what's in the does back that, of my mind, mind as well. Do you, mind, do you mind me asking that at a personal level? Does that bother you? Is that something that you struggle with? Because few people maybe understand the capacity, the scale of the struggle that's there. Um, and, you know, you're in it, you're reading about it every day. Uh, I liked your attitude that there's time and there we can do something about it. But how yeah. do you deal with that knowledge yourself um, in your own day-to-day -day life? You look at your own family and you think, geez, is that, does that drive you or does it ever get you, do you ever feel like, God, yeah, it drives me, but you know what I mean? I, I go through continuous cycles of optimism and pessimism, you know, and <laughs> things like Twitter and social media don't help either, like, no, you know, no, so it is. But, yeah, but you have to, you have to sort of uh, struggle, on, struggle on with this, to, to be honest, you know, so it is. And w I feel like working in there, you had one thing I remember, this is a story, I remember it was a five years ago now at this stage when we're, when we're doing the, one of our results-based pilot programs and we're working on the Shannon Callows with Farmers and I met some of the Shannon Action Group and we we're having discussions like this and going through what we we're doing and things like climate change and whether, we, whether the land should be drained or not should be drained. And of course, I was adamant that it shouldn't be drained like, and the, the difficulties that was going to cause uh, for them. And one of them turned to me at one stage, knowing what you know, James, how do you get up in the morning? So it is. You know, it, 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 it put me sitting back in my seat, you know, in my, tracks, in my tracks in a minute, like, you know, and I was thinking, Jesus, listen to what I've learned in the last while. How do I get up in the bloody morning? Like, you know, so it is. But I, un I understand, like, I was, I was there in the, in, the, in the 1990s, not knowing what we were doing. I've learned so much in the, in the last 20 years and still don't have any answers. But I often find particularly we're working with projects like in the, in the burn, listen to people like Dawn Sheehan on the bride. When we actually sit down uh, as groups around, around kitchen tables, I've done this in Dartmoor, the UK, when they're trialing some of their stuff for their post-Brexit environment land management systems at the moment. And within a, a couple of hours of, of listening to each other, now we put the, 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 word to, the world to rights within a, within a couple of hours and we have the, have the solutions. But then with some of these local projects, we can put things in place that will actually improve the environmental quality, potentially improve the economic viability of, of these farms, but certainly raise the profile of these farmers in terms of their standing within the, the community as a whole and the understanding of it overall. So. I think from what we what I've seen at at local level, the willingness and the ability of the the, the farmers as, as land managers to come up with solutions once they once farmers it's explained to them right this is what we need this is what we have these are the solutions this is this is uh, can you think of how this could work on your land they will find find a way if they're enabled to do it and a lot of the work we're trying to do is sort of creating an environment where farmers are empowered to make their to make appropriate decisions on their land to improve the environmental quality improve their economic viability and contribute to a, a future society that is better for the the kids they see around, sitting around their own kitchen table you know so this so that's this is where i have great hope is I might have had as much hope five, five or six years ago, but the work I've seen basically since I finished in the burn in, in 2008, it's one of the reasons I, I joined IT Sligo first. And I thought 
a lot of debate whether I would stick with the sort of Chagas side of things, the uh, research advisory that are going into academia. One of the reasons I went into academia was the word academic freedom could say what I want, when I want it, without uh, fear or favour to anybody, you know, and uh, people thought maybe that was quite scary when they heard me talking. I tend to rant, rant a bit about certain things, you know, Says, but I went with a mission when I left the burn in 2009 that we should actually, what, what I learned there, that this can be applied in, in local areas, working with people around the country, we can come up with solutions. And what was very heartening for me, just hearing Colm Hayes, Assistant Sec on the Department of Agriculture on, on Wednesday when we had a workshop, he says, well, this system has been proven. The proof of concept is there. You know, results-based payment systems work. We just have to find a mechanism now that we can scale this up without it being caught up in bureaucracy and administration costs. And well, as sure as I'm sitting here, we can find a way of doing that as well. It's not beyond the, the will of man to do that as well. So I do really have hope, irrespective of what happens with the, the cap negotiations in, in Brussels over the over the next number of months, that there is enough people in Ireland that work together to come up with a, a cap strategic plan that will sow the seeds that farmers, I think in seven years time, when we're finished with the next round, running up to our 2030 targets, we will have farmers that are basically getting a better price for, for, their, for their food in, in the marketplace. They're, they'll be branded and, and sold on, on a worldwide basis as some of the greenest agriculture products in the world and be able to stand over without people contradicting it. Because at the moment, I think there's, it's on a bit of shaky ground with some of the metrics uh, we have for it, to be, to be honest. you know. And also the farmers are basically bought into these environmental markets. It has created other opportunities for them as well. I think it's not just on the extensive side and the, the, the areas that maybe are lower in food production. I think even on the, the actual intensive farms, most farms in Ireland, you know, have up to 10% uh, what we'd call areas dominated by native vegetation or native habitats. Now, they don't necessarily have to be taken out of food production. They might be slightly a bit more extensively grazed. There might be wet patches in the, in, in the corner of fields, you know. And if we had up to 10% of these areas uh, as what I would term not non-productive areas, production support areas. These are the areas for pollination. These are areas that basically stop any loss of nutrients from our land into surrounding water, water bodies as well. So if you had 10% on that land, farmers getting adequately paid for these. So I wouldn't, I'd wouldn't. i like to see maybe in 2028, we're not talking about ineligible land. We're talking about our food producing areas. We're talking about our environment, climate, nature uh, supporting areas. Some farms will have more food producing areas than others. Other farms might have more environment product producing areas than others. But we have basically bespoke plans. Farmers are empowered to make decisions on their land and they make the decision whether they want to put an area into food production. They're not forced whether they want to put it into the food production side, whether they want to put it into environmental production, whether they want to actually incorporate it with uh, a forestry or an agroforestry system as well. And it's one of the things on the debate as well. I've mentioned it in, it was quoted in an article there on the Noteworthy recently as well, in that I think it's a shocking situation in, in Ireland that we've created a, a forestry policy where uh, planting trees are seen as bad for the environment, you know. My God, if we hand that legacy on to uh, the next generation, we've done something seriously wrong. So I think that by, I, I would hope by 2028, we see the situation where farmers across Ireland are lauded for what they do in terms of protection of the environment. Everyone is, is rowing in behind them. We have the, and I think we do need to reduce our, our meat and dairy consumption across, across the globe. But from that point of view, we have to produce the, the, the livestock and dairy on the land that's best suited to produce it with the minimum environment impact. And I, I firmly believe that Ireland is one of the best places uh, to, to do that, you know. But even with global uh, production or global consumption being reduced, I would hope that they would opt the ones if you're eating less of it, when you do eat it, you eat basically the most environmentally friendly, highest standard one you can. And that's where we need to position ourselves. It's not about quantity. I think we seriously need to position ourselves in, in world markets on the point of view of a, of a quality, quality mark, you know. And I think that's I think we're sort of a bit schizophrenic a bit about at the moment. We don't know which direction uh, we're going with a bit of a Jack and a Hyde thing yeah, there, going there's on. A bit, you know? There's a bit of that there. I think a lot of people can see what's coming. They don't see the clear roadmap, and I've had this conversation with a few people, including people yeah. who are involved in policy, is roadmaps make things clearer, goals make yeah. things a little bit clearer. And I think um, farmers want economic sustainability. Doesn't, like, you mentioned the word there, and it's about empowering people. 
And yeah. you would look at maybe some of the current food systems that we that the farmers are locked into at the moment around efficiency, yeah. drive and drive and drive. Uh, that takes a lot of the empowerment away that you don't know yeah. where price is going to go. And I think this is my own maybe uh, slightly um, challenging point, but I, I think that where I've seen farmers be more empowered about what they do, and it's from regenerative agriculture to parasite control in their farms, um, it's an incredible transition that you come yeah. off the treadmill a little bit and that you feel like you control. So if we could get that empowerment into yeah. a, a more of a national strategy, um, I think, I think look, it's big thinking, but I think it's probably where we need to go as well. Um, can I ask you a question there? Um, I think we, I, we, I contacted you to have a conversation about a project that I was interested in, that yeah. I'm working on around biodiversity. And it's not out to be a, fan, a fantastic conversation where you've been very balanced um, and I think look, you'll challenge people at times, but I think people will see the genuine passion, the interest, and, and the real leadership that's shown. And I love your idea that you're in academia because you can be a little bit freer with your, with your words. You can be more honest maybe than yeah. sometimes people allow. Um, but we're certainly not good at conversations between environmentalists and agriculture at the moment. How do we get better? Because we all need to work on this together. And if we can, we can build a better future for everybody. I know that sounds like very grandiose talk, but we need to get better at communicating together. We do definitely. I think this is this. I think this is the big barrier. There's too much pol polarization. You know, often you see when you sit down to people, they're they're saying quite similar things. They recognise the challenge that are there, but once they start criticising each other and and the blame game starts, you know, it's it's not a conducive environment to find and find and solutions. You know, so that, so I think it does come down to to basic communications and uh, understanding. And I think if particularly people that haven't grown up in farming, if they if they understood that the, particularly in, in Irish family farms, the main drive and the word you hear all the time, remember, is, is better, you know? So it is. So we have to basically define what's what's better, you know? So it is. And I know in terms of, it's quite simple in terms of, of a crop or an animal, you know, you have your, your metrics and your targets and what everyone knows when you're standing around the ring in a mart, when a good animal comes in and when one, when one that isn't great walks in as well, you know? Because we need to be getting at the same stage that a farmer can walk out onto their farm, into their field and say, well, I look at that and I see, right, I know that's good for the environment. I know that maybe that's not better. I need to improve in that situation. And it's, it is si simple things like on most, like say the dairy farmers you're working with. It's the condition of the of the hedgerows, the condition of the actual uh, field margins. It's the condition of the sward in, in in the main field as well. And I think the ultimate metric is if you can produce more grass with less nitrogen fertilizer because of maybe multi-species swards or incorporation of clover, then you know that underneath the ground, it's not the bag fertilizer and the, and the fertilizer factory that's doing the work, it's the biodiversity underneath your feet that's do, doing the work. So even a, even a simple metric that if you could, if you can grow 10,000 kg of dry matter per hectare utilizable, you know, and half your fertilizer from uh, maybe 250 down to maybe the 125 or, or 150 over, over the next, next five years, you know, then you've switched from uh, chemical supported uh, grass production to basically nature and biodiversity supported. And you know, in that sort of a sort of a metric that if, if the basically the, the chemicals aren't doing the work, someone has to be doing the work. So you have more biodiversity underneath your, underneath your feet. You have more biodiversity in your hedgerows. And I think there's great work going on with the ASAP program on water quality at, at the moment where the advisors are going out and they can pinpoint maybe pinch points on the farm that might be sources of runoff. And you can, you can actually put in a, a buffer zone or maybe relax the fertilizer application on a certain part of the field. You can put in a hedgerow, but that is also very good for biodiversity. You could create a, a pond in, in that area that could act as a silt trap, as well as actually making sure that there's no nutrient runoff on that. You can plant a, a hedgerow around that. And that also, the shelter from that can improve animal health. It can maybe dry out some, some of the areas of the field and regulate the, the climate, particularly if we've got very uh, warm weather, like in a very open paddock system, you know, uh, if we get very severe drought conditions, you know, these animals are under, you know more than this than me, will be under an awful lot of, lot of stress, you know. You'll see under even some of the whole signs, you probably, they, you know, darling, they can suffer seriously in, in heat. You need shelter in it, them areas in the as UK well. this year, a lot of heat stress. And probably in Ireland, we didn't even recognise it because we're not, we're not familiar with it. But when yeah. the heat gets up, 
uh, it, this is it's not conducive to to, to good co performance, and it's yeah. it's a challenge. Um, so this is what I could, we come back to. We need to design the whole system. So when I'm thinking about, you know, it's I think we, what we've done with uh, we call it farming for nature, you know. And uh, so if nature is basically the, the and most farmers will understand uh, stand stand nature. It's everything around that they, they farm to produce to produce the product, you know. So when you're farming for for nature, if na nature is healthy, you have the the grass production, you have the the healthy animals, you have the good yield of uh, of crops, you have the biodiversity in, in the field margins, you have the the riparian zones functioning, so they're, you're not losing nutrients uh, off the farm into the water supplies. And if we can design the systems in a more holistic uh, fashion, you know we can improve biodiversity, improve yields, cut costs, and actually improve water quality and actually improve our uh, emissions as well, you know? So, this, so a lot of this stuff isn't, isn't rocket science, but what is rocket science and what is, what is quite difficult and needs highly skilled farmers is how you understand. I can talk about the theory of this, but I walk into any new farm and you're dependent on the farmer knowing their fields. And if you can basically communicate a message, well, this field needs to be in this condition. When the, the, combine that with the knowledge the farmer has of his field, they'll be able to actually uh, produce the goods, you know? So, so I, I have that innate sort of belief for growing up as a, as a farmer as well, that there's so much knowledge, particularly in, in family farms that are handed down from generation to generation. And all we have to do to a certain extent is create the, the right vision, communicate the, the right message, put the correct incentives in place. And I mean, both on the private market side and on the, the public payment sides, we can come to a, an actual uh, good place in, in the next. Now, it's not going to change, change overnight, but I think if we have if stopped the decline by 2030 we have we basically have reducing uh, emissions like i think it's shocking what has happened since quarter we went we just went we went we went mad you know so there's and we were we from 2010 first of all the the, the emissions were coming down you know so there's and then we just sort of open the floodgates and say off you go so there's mm -hmm. and i've i've seen farms you know that certain farms can push into derogation territory but certainly not 7,000 farmers in the country. That land hasn't got that capacity without serious environmental problems. And we see that in terms of water quality. Now, in terms of water quality, we have a lot of, a lot of problems with, with urban wastewater treatments as well uh, that we have to, have to solve and, and run off from, from industry and roads, et cetera. You know? so this, but we have made a major error there. And this is one thing, there's no more than the peat situation, you know, in 2018, that within 12, 24 months, Chagas had stopped it on their own, on their own farms. But they gave out a lot of advice at the time that that should have happened. I think often they've, the expansion advice was given out first, you know, that then I, within, I remember watching her, I remember within a couple of months, they said, yes, expand, but be careful here. Don't get yourself into too much debt. But people didn't hear that message, you know, so it is. And I think now it's sort of, we have to sort of plow on. We've said it. We have to sort of prove ourselves right that we can uh, expand without the environmental consequences. And I think you see the thing is, I think you can in Moor Park. You can in these soils, you know, that are very deep, fertile soils, you know. But that's 10, 15 percent of the country at most. You know, what does 85 percent of, of the country do? We have the same. Uh, and I know I'm ranting here, but I need to get it off my chest. You know, oh, get it so, off, get it out, we, get it out. We have, yeah. We have the same grass 10 advice for every single farmer in the country. Now, I know I talk to farmers, Chagas advisor individually, oh, well, we don't mean it that way. Well, then why say it like, you know, so there's expecting like, you know, a, a farmer on the on the top of a hill to produce 10,000 kilograms of dry matter utilizable, you know, so there's, it's it's just not going to it's not going to happen. We should it, have it, realistic. It, it, is something, it is something that is a challenge, but I can see from the side of when you are trying to create a model that moves everybody together, the bespoke, yeah. and I see it. I see it from an animal health perspective as well. Is people look for the the one fits all model, and yeah. every farm is different because the person yeah. who, who rolls out of bed in the morning, walks out the front door, is different as a different approach. So exactly. that can even change between land type. And I and I really agree with you that every farm has to step back and look at. Um, even even their nitrogen application around timings of nitrogen application. Yeah. If you and I had Andre Van Varnevelt as my second guest, and he's somebody you know who's in commercial farms working, and he's reducing nitrogen usage by fifty percent by yeah. just tailoring it to the farm and the land capacity. So that's something yeah. we need to get better at doing. Yeah, um, I think, James, I think yeah. we set out to talk for half an hour, and we've broken oh, the yeah, hour mark. Right? 
Um, and um, I've been also utterly fascinated by the conversation. I think it's really important conversations to have. I think um, I commend you on your knowledge and your passion and your interest. I think um, I think we're in for a really, I don't know what the next decade will look like, but it's going to be a lot of change. This conversation will make a lot of people uncomfortable who are saying things that they don't yeah. agree with. But I think there's a huge middle ground who are waking up to the, there's, there's a different way of farming coming. We need a roadmap. We need to have conversations. We need to get better at giving that roadmap to people. Um, but it's people like you who will drive out that change and lead and have the ability to, to, to challenge us like myself and others uh, with, your, with, with what you do. So and just to I, finish, Tommy, I think every, yeah. every day is a school day as well, you know, and I have an idea that we can we can make the change. But I every farm I walk on to, every every advisor I talk to, every research scientist I talk to, I learn something from them all. And I suppose people say to me too that I often chop and change my ideas. I might have a different idea tomorrow, but that's because I've learned something in the in the 24 hours that has changed my mind. So I think we must always go through. I think I have some of the answers now, but definitely don't have them all. And I'll have different ones maybe tomorrow. But we must have this open mind and be able to adapt to the challenges that we're going to face, you know. I think that's a really powerful statement. It's something that should sit with people and, and have a think about it because this is challenging content for some people. You're, you're questioning the way they do things and you're questioning the future and, and uncertainty creates great fear. Um, mm. But I think I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, look, I'm probably a bit too optimistic in my life, but I'm optimistic that we have a massively important decade ahead for us in Irish agriculture. And I think we are well up for the challenge. We have the capacity to produce um, on, on a production level, but actually deliver on an environmental level as well. James, we believe uh, we can be a world leader. Yeah, uh, yeah. world leaders. Yeah, I think <laughs> yeah. absolutely. And if yeah. we don't believe that, uh, we're in big trouble. I think we start with the belief and then the will, the science yeah. and the leadership. Um, fantastic conversation. Um, I've taken up most of your evening and night now at this stage. Um, uh, thank you so much for having a conversation that I, that I didn't expect or plan to have. I was going to ask you some advice. I think you've made me think about what where the farms are going around biodiversity. I'm sure I'll have more questions for you. Um, uh, so I, I, I sincerely thank you for your time. And we'll be talking again, I'm sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so All much, right. James. All right, thanks. All right, bye.